from the banks of Dewey Lake, it's the Dewey Pod Monster. Welcome back. My name is John, and this is the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. This is your weekly podcast and the original podcast about consumption. Uh, with me is the host of the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. His name is Sean, and we have a special guest this week, John Iceberg. Uh, he's the director of Final Summer, and we're quite honored to have you with us. John, how are you doing tonight? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been a long day. I had a long shoot running around a massive uh, warehouse. So, uh, yeah, so it's nice to sit down and talk to you. Thanks for having me. Are we allowed to ask what you're working on, or is that something that's on oh, your yeah, top secret right a, now? It's a commercial sheet. Uh, okay. Lots of lots of Dan Dolly stuff today. Well, got to you know do what you got to do between stuff, oh, yeah. right? I don't want to you know hide the uh, main attraction too much, so we wanted to bring you on to get a chance to talk about Final Summer. So for those listening or those watching that haven't seen it, we did a full episode review on the film Final Summer in October a couple weeks ago. We were both fans of it. And John, since you're the director, why don't you give us a little quick crash course on what Final Summer is about, and then we'll kind of go from there with it. Sure. Yeah, Final Summer, to me, I wanted to make a film that felt like a forgotten slasher franchise film from the 80s. And so I really went back to the early 80s. Um, and a lot of the slasher films that I kind of grew up on or that my, well, more accurately, I had like two older cousins that would like watch these movies and I would hear about it. I wanted to make a slasher film that was kind of a really fun roller coaster ride mixed with kind of like what you would really do if you were in a slasher film, you know, so kind of a lot of the humor that comes from from that this that situation but then also the reality of that kind of a thing originally we were going to do like this like kind of creature feature thing where like you know like there's a car breaks down in the woods mm -hmm. and there's something in the mist or whatever but then there was, i don't know if you ever saw that movie monster it was basically that it was like a mom and her daughter are stuck oh in this yeah, yeah when i saw that i was like yeah we probably should do that but <laughs> and it really it was just about you know, like I always go back to like, um, you know, what are the things that you have around you that you can make a movie with? And I started to see all these summer camps around. I'm like, well, I love summer camp slashers. And that's a one. Mm -hmm. I was stupid. And I thought that was a one location film. But it's like, you know, one camp with like hundreds of acres and <laughs> like 87 different locations in it. But it kind of grew out of that, I guess. I did. I went through like 19 drafts and script. And, uh, you know, we would go. I would go to the camp all the time to just scout and think about shots and you know, places in the camp that kind of talked to me a little bit, like the pool that kind of jumped out and the kitchen and the, the bridges. And it was really just about finding, finding like what we had and trying to make a film from that, you know? And so that was kind of where it came from. And I, I was like, well, how hard could that be? And then <laughs> it was like the hardest thing I've ever done, basically. So you mentioned, um, some of the influences for this movie being like camp slashers and stuff like that. And one of the things that I noticed, I picked up on right away because it's right at the beginning of the movie. It's when we oh, meet yeah. the, the main <laughs> character, Warren Copper. And there's a shot that feels very much so like it, it's almost shot for shot, like a remake of Jason's introduction in the Friday the 13th remake. Oh, um, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. intentional or was that oh, yeah. just it's like... Not, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I loved, I loved the cinematography of that one. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, re recently, like I, I, I just I started following Daniel Pearl on um, Instagram or whatever, and I just kind of shouted out about like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then he like retweeted. I was like, oh my god! But like, and then we kind of talked on the side or whatever. But I, I totally forgot that he shot, you know, that reboot of uh, Friday Thirteenth, and I love the look of that film a lot because it, you know, it was, I think it was anamorphic and it had that great, to me, it was kind of hilarious to think about a, you're in the forest, but somehow there's lens flare in it. And so, it was, yeah. yeah. and so I kind of did that as, as a nod to him. And then also, also that shot was very much a kind of a nod to Daniel Pearl. And so it's, I've, I've, you know, people are like, oh, you rip off of whatever, but it's like, you know, I, I think we wear our influences, you know, we have to start somewhere, I think. And it's like, people always say like and you know, was it some people borrow and like you know whatever steals and stuff but i, mm. I think that's where you as you're finding your voice you kind of have to pull from the things that you know and i think i mean those those films like i mean i don't know how many times i got in a conversation with someone about that shot in halloween when you know michael myers comes out of the shadows behind her yeah and even there i was watching a something recently with like dean Cundy, and he was talking about that shot where he they would turn the, the the lamp up a little bit, you know, so then I would just come into that. Oh, it's just so iconic, you know? And so I think like, I don't know, I, just, I love cinematography a lot. So I think that 
his his kind of take on the Friday the Thirteenth to me was probably the most beautiful and cool looking of the Friday the Thirteenth because I don't know like the first Friday the Thirteenth it's like when it gets to night it's like they're in a black box you know like when they're fighting on the beach and everything it's like dude could you not throw a light like behind her or something just in the back mm-hmm. <laughs> you know but I, I get it it's it, they were you know working with like you know film stock and we have digital which is totally different but uh yeah no i definitely loved uh the look of that and then that was also like something we wanted to do was make the night forest like feel like you could see more of the night you know the feel we kind of wanted the audience to feel like you were at the camp with them and like you were in the forest the movie you can tell obviously has influences and wears a lot of those on its sleeve but were there you know you went to the camp and you had all these different locations were there things that you hadn't really planned on or shots that you didn't plan on that when you got to the location just something inspired you to say no we gotta we, we gotta add something at this location because it really fits oh, yeah. the story that you're trying to tell oh yeah totally yeah there was um like for one one specifically was fun because it, it i kept going through it and i was like man this place is so cool and it was this uh the pool house where like peter whacks the killer in the face with with the pool noodle because i loved i loved the tile in there it was kind of creepy you know it just had this like kind of old school 80s like 70s kind of pool house tile thing going on and then there was all these noodles because really it was just supposed to play out where like peter runs off into the distance but i was like you know it'd be really funny as if like you know because to go back to like what if what would you do if you're really in a slasher film and i felt like if you're running through you know like you are panicking and you're grabbing at any last thing and so you're not thinking straight and so i thought it'd be really funny if like peter's getting chased in there and he like falls and he grabs for something and he just hits him with the pool noodle and I thought of my cousins too and how they thought that would really be funny. So I, we put that in there because I, but I, I love that, that just that place. And I think, you know, it was just one of those things where like, it was probably the, the day or two before we shot it, I was like, you know, that's really cool looking in there. Let's, we should go in there. And so we did that. And it, it was funny because that was probably the easiest to edit where a lot of what we do kind of earlier on was we'd shoot things kind of methodically where we get our wide shot and we cut in for our coverage and all this kind of stuff. But for that one, I was just kind of on my easy rig, just following the action and then I'd do it from the opposite and then we'd get some inserts. And that was a very easy scene to shoot. It was probably the easiest one we did, but, um, but it was just a lot of fun. And then there were just other places that really spoke to me. Um, like the kitchen was really cool. Um, I remember the first time I, I went there, I went there in the winter with Scott with my son and I, had him stand in like this clearing where the the killer is so like there's this wide shot where you see them all walk out to see the killer there and i just had my son my son sounds weird stand out there <laughs> in the clearing i was like oh man i could see like with the trees and everything and how everything i could see them all walking out and then i just got this idea it'd be so funny if like you know they think it's like just somebody screwing with them and so like you got the guy going out there like yelling like where the hell you been like we've been chasing we've been looking for your dumbass or whatever and so so I think things like that. And then um, I think there was there was a couple of times where we, we intentionally just I wanted to just mess with the audience. So there's a, when Lexi goes to her cabin, uh, I was like, what well, what do you think is going to piss the audience off more if we leave the door open or if we shut it? So we all kind of agreed that we should leave the door open to make everybody nuts. And so because, <laughs> you know, it's like as a slasher fan, as a horror fan, sometimes like half of the fun of these films is like, go. <laughs> I right. Did, like, why? Like, you got a perfectly. I mean, I, I, I still can't get over Halloween ends. How, like, you know, Jane, what's her? Karen, gets him on the the stairs with the pitchfork and then just drops it. I'm like, <laughs> double tap. You know, I mean, yeah. I, you know, like you go to Zombie Land. I think that's what's so funny about Zombie Land when it came out is because it it took the tropes and it spun it. But uh, you know. Well, it's I think just... horror's at its best when it takes tropes and kind of plays with them. Like it, oh, we yeah. all know that we all have an expect expectation that when you're getting chased by the bad guy, that something dumb is going to happen. Like oh, you yeah. should be getting into the running car and driving away and never coming back, but right. I'm going to go back to save my cat or something like that. So. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. The alien. Yeah. 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 Like, that was the funny thing. Cause I was always, I, I heard save, save the cat forever as, as a story kind of clock kind of thing. And then it was only recently when I was like, Oh, that's from alien. I'm like, oh my god that's right like she literally you know ripley's so smart and cool and everything that she goes to save her damn cat right which never really seemed to bother me that much until until you realize it's like oh because the movie needed to happen a little bit longer than it was happening so 
That cat's the biggest asshole in that whole movie. Oh too. my god, Jonesy! <laughs> I mean, Harry Dean Stanton dies because that yeah. stupid cat. You know, it's the, sad, the cat gets know? more jump scares yeah. than the xenomorph does. I think in that entire movie. Oh, oh, and the cat lives. <laughs> I mean, he's in the he stays <laughs> back. The Marines all die. Hudson dies, but no, no, cat lives. That's that bastard cat man. I saw it. <laughs> and that's why cats are. Yeah. fucking evil no it was cool i think i think that the location definitely i think it influenced a lot and then definitely the pool scene i think i always thought it would be kind of fun to have it kind of end in this place of course then it was like when we got to the camp the pool was half drained and so i i had a panic attack because i was like that's literally our like i went to the camp like a week before everything was cool and then i got there like the week later and it was halfway empty and i was like losing my mind i'm like that's the end of our our film and so their their compromise was they just because it had a leak in it they just threw a hose in and let it run the entire time that we were at the camp <laughs> and 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 it wasn't like you know warm water it was just pure oh tap. yeah no so i i think i was i wouldn't <laughs> i wouldn't expect it to be warm water that would be oh too convenient and then you get there yes, and, and your had... major plot device is <laughs> effectively oh, gone oh my god oh yeah i was trying to think of how we could rewrite the ending if we had to and i was like i, I can't really think of it better <laughs> i'm just freaking out now and then but then we finally got it but it was so cold i, I was like having hypothermia i think while we were filming the ending or whatever because uh i was just in there with the cast or whatever and the first take we did was great but all of the crew wanted to see the shot because we were shooting in like a 360 so every time I got like the first take I, I was my favorite, but every crew person was like in a shot, you know, like in it. And I was like losing my mind. So we got the second take when I was frozen. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard of a movie shoot involving water where people said the water was like a good temperature. Like anytime I hear about water being mo used in a movie, it always sounds like right. everyone's just miserable because of how cold <laughs> everything is. Oh, yeah, like Waterworld, and what's the other one? The Abyss, you know? Oh, Return of the Living Dead has the big uh, rain scene in the cemetery, right. which I guess was uh, just terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there's no water in the second one, I don't think. So, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty sure there's not any water scenes in that one. So we mentioned that a lot of the influences on this movie are kind of, some of them are kind of like worn on its sleeve, and that's to its credit. But, like, we noticed right off the bat, like, movies like Friday the 13th, Sleep Sleepaway Camp, and The Burning, and, you know, you're big camp slashers are there some movies that might have influenced it that we might have overlooked or not have been so obvious oh yeah i think um well some of them were were probably more subconscious because when i would watch the movies later i was like oh wow i didn't even think about that you know hmm. and i think it's just i think that these movies become such a part of you know like your kind of language when you're thinking about horror i think sometimes like i i didn't even think about when when we did the there's like this door scene where like the killer kills ronnie and how we shot it i just remember oh we gotta get the shot of the feet and then recently i watched like halloween back to back with with final summer like on my projector and when they get to the part where he kills like uh the boyfriend and the and, the, and just seeing his feet on the so i think there's like a, a common language i think in a lot of horror films and when you've seen so many horror films i think you you kind of are like oh yeah i'm gonna go to that scene or you or or, or not not even you're thinking of that you're just thinking of the shot because just feels natural it feels right and then you mm. realize later on oh it's from this so i think like prom night prom night had some interesting things just with the killer i think with uh just the, the look and the feel it wasn't like a big killer so i think like the the size of the killer the fact they would wear mask and the axe and everything was kind of you know it felt really at home um i feel like my bloody valentine had a bit in there uh, i think the burning madman was a big influence on the the fire the campfire scene i think and also obviously like friday 13 part was it two i think right yeah two yeah. where they're at the thing but um i don't know there's just a lot in there and then i think um i thought a lot about scream uh mainly with like because the stuff i went through like i i was in this pretty abusive a relationship with someone who ended up being like a total sociopath, uh, like a narcissist, whatever antisocial personality sort of kind of person. And so it was pretty terrifying, but it kind of took a lot of like what I went through and put that into the film. And, and it kind of helped me to inform the villain a bit. And then also things that they would do because I saw so much of that, like malignant narcissistic behavior or whatever, where they're always like, gaslighting you and stuff. And they're so full of themselves or whatever in a way. And so I thought it'd be really fun. Some of the humor I think is, comes from a dark place of having lived through that shit where it's like i go back to like with scream like if, if billy was really a psychopath he would have killed Stu eventually you know because well, it's the only person that knows 
what's going on, you know. You'd argue so, that he tries to in the movie. That's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I felt like for me, it's it, it was funny because someone was like, well, you know, like the, Linnea doesn't give her big plan away at the end of the film. I'm, and one, I was like, well, that would probably never happen in real life. And if they said anything at all, it would just be to gaslight you. So they've mixed truth and lies. But two, she kind of starts it, but then she's interrupted by Mike. And I think that pisses off her like narcissism. You know, I, I would say Alien was a big one on the structure because I, I studied the structure of Alien a lot for how to do the structure for this film. And, you know, it does take some time getting there to that final, like, you know, and sure. when the, you know, when the, you know, Harry Sand goes to get Jones. That's kind of like the midpoint right there, really. Oh. Well, it's also kind of like, you know, with comedy, they say when sometimes comedians, they tell like the same jokes in parallel. In a way, it's kind of like right. you're saying this common language with horror. It's kind of the same thing. Multiple people can come up with ideas that are similar, but, you know. I digress. I oh, don't yeah. even know if I had a point with saying that. I felt like being no, no, no. scholarly with my comedy uh, <clears throat> knowledge or something. No, I think no, I think you bring up a good point because it's like we kind of have to take we have to take these things and make it our own because what's you know because I was like from the beginning I was like well what's the point of making this film because there's like a you know there were like a thousand nine hundred nineteen like slasher films on Amazon oh, wow. <laughs> so I was like what's going to make this any different you know and so I I kind of felt like well I think taking it from the point of view of like my own experience and putting that into like the character of Lexi and then into the character of Warren Copper. Cause I feel like those two characters are really me at different points. And my, in that whole thing, like, I feel like I was very close to Lexi when I was coming out of all that stuff. And so I was, I had like really bad PTSD for a long time. And, and then I feel like now I'm much more like Warren Copper where like, you know, if something triggers me, I'll go into that place a bit, but I'm not, but I can see it in a different perspective now. And even like my, my dad was a paramedic for 35 years. And so he had PTSD pretty bad from all the stuff that he saw. And so there are nods to like his stuff too, because he wanted to be a, a, a forest ranger. He always tells, you know, like the Smokey the Bear stuff. And so I kind of see mm -hmm. that story and kind of as a nod to my dad, because I thought it'd be funny if, you know, because you, you take the classic slasher campfire story, but then you spin it and it's really just a Smokey the Bear story. It's, it's not a, it's not a slasher story. <laughs> Yeah, it's basically just like I'm just thinking of like the the you know like if you're telling this to like your campers, you're scaring the crap out of them, so they'll make sure to have like good fire safety. You know, is the gag, really? And it's just <laughs> so it's just kind of funny. But I, I think you're right though. It's like you have to kind of take them and make them your own thing. And I feel like in some of ways that kind of bit me a little bit on this first one. And I feel like that's where I I can see with with the second one that we're gonna make is like making it much more its own thing, making it more like it'll be nice to not go so much into like oh let's let's revisit like this psychopathic bullshit i went through <laughs> for, for part two and so i think for the next one it'll be it's nice. good to leave that stuff in the past it is so. you know <laughs> which is interesting because that's basically a huge theme for part two is you know leaving the past in the past or whatever but uh but i think that's that's i think the exciting thing for me is just having been able to listen to a lot of the feedback from different people talking about the first one and you know, I don't think I want to make another film so in the shadow of other films. But, uh, but yeah, that's kind of me right now. So Well, it seems, too, like when you get, you know, the first movie is always the one that you kind of plant the initial idea. And then two is where, yeah. you know, where you start to really amplify or start to <laughs> oh, yeah. magnify everything. I mean, we think of a movie that John and I have talked about recently is like Terrifier, right? The first Terrifier comes out, yeah. it's not. And now it seems like it's just has, you know, the world by the balls. But because everybody seems to look Sean really I, yeah, hates it. I don't He's like making clowns, this comparison, so. by the way. So <laughs> that'll, yeah, that won't be news no, to anyone. But the first one lays the groundwork, and there's not really much of a story to it. But when you get to the second yeah. one, and not to not inferring that about this movie, but this, you get to the second one, and that's where they everything just starts to. They, they've they've given you the main character, the main bad guy, the main villain, the people that what you're watching the movie for, and then. You know, they start to expound on that. They start to build on that, and that's where that that idea, you know, it kind of forges itself. It gets a little bit, a little stronger. Yeah. And well, totally. I think it's interesting because I I feel like because I kind of thought of it as like, well, as Final Summer, if it was like a, a, a slasher trilogy franchise kind of thing. So the first one is really about fight or flight, and I think the the interesting thing I think I find is like, and, and some films have proven. I was watching The Gray recently, and I was like, well, what is it about this film that gives you the sense that there's all these characters in this film. It's an ensemble film, but you kind of get the chance to know, except for the people that kind of die immediately in the crash. There are other people you start to get to know, you know? And so I'm like, what is it about it? And sometimes it's really as simple as like a throwaway line, you know, like that guy's mm -hmm. talking about, like, I, 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 I can't die without, you know, having 
sex one more time because like I can't die out on that <laughs> terrible <laughs> the last partner he was with <laughs> which is really funny but like it, I think those little beats like give you as an audience a chance to like even like for us one line get to, to like or know someone a little bit more than you do and so I feel like that's something I was thinking about for part two is like okay that's kind of what it takes I think for an audience to like at least feel something for even like your 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 supporting characters or whatever but then and then also, I think just just the the sense that the film was such a kind of a roller coaster from the time the killer shows up, it's kind of run into the end. I feel like the way I kind of wrote it and planned it, it you know, I feel like it kind of limited a, the ability to kind of have some of that exposition, have some of that character beats. And there were some in there, but I think um, that's where I think with part two, it's like extended it for like a couple of days. So it's like instead of like one night only, it's like leading up to a thing. And so that's that's where I feel like there's more there's probably a better chance for character development in the second one. And then also like, you know, like to go to like the problems sequels, it's like, I feel like it was funny because I just kind of cracked, like I had the story for a long time, but I've, it, it would go off in these like un- needlessly complicated, overly complicated, and you really see the problems of sequels, you know, where it's like, oh my God, all of a sudden I have like 13 people, <laughs> three bad guys, what the hell is this? And so I, I went back and I looked at like Halloween ends and I remember thinking of all the criticism of that was like, well, if he would have just been in kills, you know, maybe we would have felt differently about Corey showing up in part three. But I don't know that David Gordon Green ever thinks yeah. that far ahead, though, you know. I still think they could have saved that whole movie with one shot at the end showing this Silver Shamrock building. And that would have oh, saved that like, entire yeah, yeah. movie. Oh, so, completely. <laughs> yeah. Would have made the but, whole thing make sense, but they didn't oh, yeah. do that. So, yeah. so I kind of look we're, back were the few people that actually like that movie so yeah i like halloween that's too but i guess I, I i look back at the first one i was like okay like the everything that is in the first one needs to be addressed in part two because there's so much we don't know about the characters and, and this was kind of something i thought about early on too was like when i was with this person it was like just when i thought i would solve the because there were so many like crazy things happening all the time and so many things that you couldn't make sense of or whatever and then you think you would find out you're like oh i've, I've figured out what it is and then you realize you're looking at like one instead of like you you've solved the puzzle it's like you realize you're looking at one side of like a rubik's cube and so there's like i didn't even see this over here this is crazy like what is this over here? who is that guy you know so it was all this stuff and so i remember thinking that there are these pieces that are happening in the film there's stuff that's like there's some papers that are being and burn there's some documents that are showing up here and there there's there's elements of this bigger plan and so i feel like as we're with lexi for a lot of it or these main characters it's there's all these pieces that are happening and that was kind of what i wanted the audience to feel like now i realize now it's like i should probably give people more to to think about <laughs> but you don't know when it's your first yeah, film you know it's, and it's I, I gotta be super tough that's that's another thing i was gonna ask is like how many like unseen things just pop up that you have no that you have you there's no way you could even plan for it it's got to be a, a gazillion things that just come out of the blue that you know you plan you do the best you can you storyboard you do all the things yeah. you set up your story you have all your locations scattered like you said earlier you find a cool place yeah. you decide to do that but how many like unseen issues come up with making a film where, oh you know, God. you, you've oh done God. cinematography in the past, but this is your first like big crack at a, yeah. at a, at a feature. Right. So it's gotta be just yeah. mind numbingly difficult to even think ahead, to be able to plan for stuff like that. Oh yeah. It's funny. Cause I think the funniest thing about it is like you go through all of this. And one of my friends told me early on, he's like, you know, a completed film is a miracle. And it's like, your film is hanging by a thread. And it can fall apart at any point in time. And I used to joke, but I, I totally believe this is true. It's like when I, I would go to Walmart and I'd see like the $5 bin of DVDs. I'm like, that's a $5 bin of miracles that, you know, <laughs> Sharknado, that's a miracle. You know, Bird, that's a miracle. All this stuff. You know, the room, that's a freaking miracle, you know. And, and there is so many. Th- and I think one of my friends, Rob uh stern he's a cinematographer and a really good mentor to me and you know he's moved to champagne and he shot a bunch of films for shutter we just did a workshop at my house like a week ago on diffusion and and all film is not anymore it's just problem solving i think but he kind of said something that really struck me is like is this a situation or is this a problem and so if it's a problem then how do we deal with it and if it's a situation that's just what it is you know and so I think for me, there were days when it was like just a situation, like my sound guy quit, like right before we were supposed to do the scene where like Moose gets attacked in the in the cabin, you know, like uh, so Moose and Georgia were supposed to fight. the, And it was supposed to be this great scene where like Moose and, and the killer are struggling and then the light 
So the, the, the light, the lamp that falls on the ground was supposed to start getting kicked around. And so it was going to play like on George's face and you were going to see this hard shadow on the walls of like the killer, like kind of trying to kill Moose and Moose fighting back. And it's supposed to all play out where like they're kind of in the in the foreground out of focus. And you're just seeing the whole fight happen on George's face. But then the sound guy quit. And so instantly I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> Well, I guess I have something else <laughs> to know, focus on. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Or like, you know, like I, I went to do the pool scene with like Lexi and Georgia. And then this friend of mine like told me he's like, like, I'm walking because he had a problem with like the, the shoot schedule. And then the next day I woke up and he, he had fired an email off to the entire cast and crew telling everybody to walk. And so I was like uh, dealing with all these putting out fires yeah. all the time. And uh, and then four days before we went to start, like um, we had these equity investors that basically had tried to steal the film from us. And so I had to, so we make, if I had to turn down, cause they were throwing like 50 grand and So I told them I couldn't take their money and we just made it without them, but that caused a lot of stress too. And so it was just a lot of, and it was, uh, I mean, everybody that worked on the film, this was their first film they'd ever worked on. So, and most of them came out of my workshop. So prior to this, you know, we would go and we would do like night four, six year exercises where we'd learn what it was like. Cause I, I've done some overnights. I, I was on a film called Slice and it's, it's tough, you know, like night lighting sucks, you know, because you have to know what you're doing. Cause there's so many variables of like, you don't want it to look lit, you know, is the thing. And so it, it was, so, I mean, incredible crew. I mean, the fact that we pulled off what we did with college kids on their first movie ever, it's like, to me, like, that's the biggest miracle. I don't really care. Like if I get a bad review, I'm like, oh, this is amazing because <laughs> we shouldn't even be here. You know what I mean? So I think it's just the tenacity to get through it. There's so many different things, but I think you're just, you're just naive enough to make your first film. And then you realize you just dug like a big hole for yourself. And now you spend the rest of your time trying to get out of your hole, you know? And so it was, I'd say the first two days were like eight to eight. And then we went into this uh, splits of two to two where you start at two in the afternoon you wrap at two in the morning and that first night when we shifted was that was like when it got real for everybody because <laughs> it was like we were trying to make a 1980s studio film with like mm -hmm. no money you know with people who have never done night lighting before so it was that was the first kind of real gut check i think for everybody in the film where they were like wow like <laughs> this sucks so it's a, it's a miracle, I think, that we're here at all. So the question so. is, why why put yourself through that again? Like, that's you just got to love it, right? I mean, it's got to be something that you just feel like you have to do, like a calling almost. Oh, 100%. Oh, yeah, 100%. Because I think, like, it's so, you you realize, like, you know, like, we like I, I feel like I grew up on, like, visions of Spielberg and stuff. But then I, I got really brought into it by listening to stories of Kevin Smith and Robert Rodriguez and stuff. And now it's like, it, it's so hard, I think, to, you know, to, to have those kinds of careers anymore because with, with streaming, it's like, man, like, you know, where do you get money for your next film? And, and, and the reality, I think, is like, it's just like crowdfunding is such a key part of it, too. And, and God bless, like, the horror fans and the horror community, because I don't know how anyone would make any other films, you know, because I feel like that at least is a passionate fan base who will give a give a filmmaker a shot, you know, versus like, you know, making a drama or something else. It's like you're just you're basically screwed from day one that you wrote that, like, you know, comedy. <laughs> well, it helps with horror, yeah. too, that like so many of us and I'm not saying that Final Summer has bad performances. In fact, we yeah. praise the performances in right. Final Summer. But so many horror movies we like because of the cheesiness and the oh, yeah. questionable performances and all that stuff. It's right. almost like a spot where you can go to see people kind of learning how to do whatever they're going to do going forward. Oh, so, 100%. I mean, I, I go back. I, I'm always inspired by like Sam Raimi because he did Within the Woods, which turned into Evil Dead, which he went back with some more money made Evil Dead too. But then I mean, if you would have looked at like within the woods, you would have would you have ever thought like Spider Man Two is going to come out of that guy? You know what I mean? Or like Dark Man, which is probably one of my favorites mm -hmm. that he's done. You know, or Simple Plan even. You know, and so I think like that to me is so inspiring because I feel like I think horror is really actually challenging because one you have like this audience <laughs> that is like probably the most tough audience. You know, and so and so that's really interest it that's can be very intimidating but also i think there is so much visual storytelling in in a horror film that it doesn't happen in a drama per se where you like ah oh, shit i didn't get the insert of like the door handle does the audience is the audience going to know like that the door is locked or some you know 
or shit, like when did he grab the ax or, you know, like all this kind of stuff. So like you need to be on top of all of your, your shots and your coverage and, and, and really kind of understand the edit too. And, uh, you know, like I, I love like Brian De Palma. Have you ever seen like Blowout at all? I, I haven't. So. Oh man, it's a great freaking film. It's, it's basically a slasher, but it's, but just like all the stuff he does with the cameras. So it's, so I think like horror is a very, you know, it's a, it's a great place to, to, to go. And I, I love horror too. So I think for me, it was fun. I think like, again, going back to like, you know, I love like those 80s slashers because they taught it, they took it seriously, you know, like, mm-hmm. and so like you go to like, like prom night, all these films are, are taking the genre seriously. And I think where, Screen came along was kind of at the right time for that film, but then now it's like you get a slasher film. It's they got to like tar, you know, they have to dress it up so much with like, oh, it's a Back to the Future meets a slasher. Now it's it's a Wonderful Life pieces. I'm like, oh my god! I'm like, just give me. Is it that hard? Just give me a psychopath in a, in a mask chasing people at night. You know, like just give me that. Like I want the meat and potatoes thing. Just give me that thing. Just don't 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 be don't overcomplicate. The I shit. have to <laughs> ask you: Is there an It's a Wonderful Life slasher? movie <laughs> you didn't no. see that one it's a wonderful night no. i think it's coming out now <laughs> no uh-uh. i mean i'm sure it's cool but it's like you know like well like you said sounds like the kind of thing we'll yeah, watch prob- so. we probably will end up watching that but <laughs> i think it's a bloom house one or something like that you know but i, I don't maybe know maybe not I think, then <laughs> so. I think, like you know like i like i like the final girls a lot but i i, hmm. I was always like ah oh, man like they're doing it's like final girls is so good but I felt like I would have loved to see more of like nighttime kind of scenes and stuff like that. And I, to me, I just, I wanted this to go back to that thing. Like I didn't want it to just be, you know, like, like I wanted to be, have some fun, but the humor to be in the, the point of view of like, that this is really happening. So a lot of the humor is kind of like part of the situation itself versus like, you know, like meta humor yeah, it's or all whatever. In context. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, but then to still make it scary <laughs> i think you make an interesting point though like you said everything has to be kind of gussied up you know it can't just be yeah. straight it's got to be and, and going back to scream and and saying you know it did come at the right time because that was it was making fun of the genre but also being a serious yeah. horror film yeah. at the same time giving you the rules oh, yeah. and jamie kennedy kind of kicking out all that stuff who kind of going back to that did you take were there specific directors that you took inspiration f- from for this movie oh yeah i would say wes craven for one because i love I love uh, his like female protagonists and his films a lot are very resourceful and very smart. And so uh, I go back to um, obviously like, you know, Heather Langenkamp and Nightmare on Elm Street. She's tough. I mean, she's like setting booby traps up. I mean, she's going into the dream to fight him, to bring him back. She's very resourceful. And I wanted our girls and our women and our uh, characters in our film to be strong and tough and not just shriek and run and fall over every last, you know, thing in the forest, you know, but so I think Lexi to me is very, Lexi was a tough character because she does have PTSD. And when you meet her, she's in the, in the kind of the tunnel, I call it of PTSD, where you're just kind of, you're in that kind of tunnel where you can't, I remember just being in some situations where someone might be talking to me or they'd be right next to me. I wouldn't even know for 10 minutes that they were talking to me and they're like, dude, but you listen to me. I'm like, huh? Like, Oh, oh, I should not even see you there. So to go to those directors, I think Wes Craven is one. And then I like Jordan Peele a lot, too, for like the, the setups and payoffs he does, which I think are like he's just got a great sense of humor. What I love with Jordan Peele, what he does is he he always respects like that this is the character. So the character better react like, I, you know, like sometimes I feel like in some of these movies, when you see the character, you're with them. And then the third act, they're like a completely different <laughs> character, even though it's this yeah. actor. You're like, where did this come from? <laughs> the dude's like doing and shit. Or whatever. She just you know? inserted a new and actor so in like, there. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're him. like, what is all of a sudden he knows all these things. You're like, where you should have known that like earlier in the film. What's going on here? And and also was it Tom Holland who did um Fright Night and all that stuff. So I, I love like a lot of those eighties movies, you know, where that's kind of like my biggest influences probably is is those those like Wes Craven and stuff, I think. Speaking of the eighties, you have Tom Matthews in this movie who's kind yeah. of a eighties <laughs> legend and I, I really dig that he's doing all these independent films. You got any good Tom Matthews stories from when he was around? I mean, he's he's just really cool. I really liked him a lot. I'm excited because he's coming back for part two in a in a in a bigger. Nice. He'll have a much bigger role in part two, which is exciting. And I just liked. I think I, I love to work with actors who have kind of a, a film language, and I, I could like. He's been doing this for a long time, so he could you know. Mm-hmm. 
so it was nice to, to talk with him and just work through some of the blocking and some of those things. And, 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 you know, it's like when you work with really good actors, yeah, I worked on a film called Brooklyn 45 and, you know, some of them, they could just, uh, just, you know, just sit there in the chair when they're like, all right, we're getting ready to roll. And then they, <laughs> they just like turn themselves on or whatever, you know, and, uh, but it's, it's cool. Uh, I think that's just the fun of it is that they have, they kind of have a, a, a naturalism to their performance, which is really nice. Um, I think that's, the th you know, and, and I think this is the thing too, like you're talking earlier about like bad actors and stuff like that. And, and I think it's just like that they're like, we're all kind of honing our craft or whatever we're sure. getting and, and so we're kind of cutting our teeth. And so, and recently I was watching Halloween kills and Halloween ends because one of the scenes was like on paper is like, this is pretty cheesy. It's like, you know, like they're just talking to the parents or whatever. And like everything that they're saying is cheesy, but I'm like, why does this not feel cheesy? And so I thought that was really interesting to think about. And I think it's like, they have more coverage of a scene. Sometimes uh, they have better editors who are more experienced, who can, make that scene pop you know the actors are able to take like this corny line of dialogue like the two cops who are talking about the bound me sandwich and then the guy's like like your sandwich is that your lunch looks like something a five-year-old would make or whatever and that's mm -hmm. it's a corny scene but it's like they do it in a way that's really great so i think there's something to you know when you're looking at like emerging filmmakers and emerging actors and stuff it's like they are learning and so i think it's like you're starting to see the pieces come together and i, I saw a movie called royal tenenbaums that was like a wes anderson film and there's a scene in it between like gene hackman and angelica houston where they're standing outside and it's like this one continuous take that's just a static locked off shot it goes on for so long and i remember at one point it, it felt like the the illusion broke and i could tell they were acting and it was so strange to me where it's like gene hackman is not a bad actor but the scene the the, the illusion broke and it was so fascinating because like after each festival screening i'd go back and i'd recut the film and i'd keep cutting cutting scenes down and making things tighter and some, sometimes like a line would overlap or this and that or you know just tighten these things up and then it was like that the performance was there so I think sometimes like what we take, what we consider bad acting is really just bad editing or whatever, or just, just that not necessarily bad editing, but just loose editing. So mm. it's, it's almost too loose where if you start to tighten it up, then it's, it's popping, you know, like there's, there's many scenes that I cut off like a couple of lines at the top of it and at the end of it. So they always say like, was it leave, arrive late and leave early kind of a thing with your, with your edits and with your scenes. So, so I think, yeah, there, there was just, it was, it went through a lot of iterations, but I think that that's probably the thing when we when we look at films. So I think sometimes I would try to look at like films that like my friends have made. I'm like, okay, like I see what they're doing. And it's probably just like a, a sense of the scenes playing a little bit too long, you know, and you can tell, mm -hmm. like, I'm sure when you're like, oh, the scene's going on forever. And, and I have ADD. So for me, I'm like, oh shit, we got to get out of this thing. You know? But anyway, <laughs> Where's the trap door? are we still at the cabin? Oh my God, we got to get out of this dining hall. Oh my God. So anyway, <laughs> and it was funny, actually, you know, you, you mentioned another one, um, Night of the Living Dead was a big influence on this film, too, because the dining hall basically to me was like the farmhouse a bit, you know. OK. And so, like, so if you think about it, like they're always kind of in the, the dining hall a bit and they go out to try to get people to come back or whatever. And then eventually it's like kind of like eventually the zombies go into the farmhouse. Eventually the killer comes into the dining hall and then there is no safe space at all. So I felt like so that was kind of a big influence as well as Night of Living Dead. Really, well, so. they use it as like a, a meeting place, right? And that's where they go out and they explore and, and come back with the recon oh, yeah. that they've made. Oh, hey, have you found, you know, this person, have you found right, this? Yeah. That? They come back to that. Yeah. So when, like you said, when the killer comes in there, whoosh, can't come here anymore. Yeah, it's, it's not it's ours. You're, you're screwed. Yeah, yeah. it's like yeah. A, a safe house or something is not so safe anymore. Yeah. And there's sometimes there's just like little happy accidents that would happen. I remember, you know, like it was, it, it, it's funny, like, you know, when you make your film, you, you half the time I feel like you're just trying to, you just, you're just there when I would watch it with the audience, which I, I always hated because it just made yeah. me anxious for like eight two weeks. Was like, you're just hoping that it slides by and no one notices all of the gaping holes in your film. <laughs> you know, like, like where did the ax come from and how did she know that the, 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 it was in his chest and all that stuff but sometimes i think it's like decisions you make when you have hypothermia aren't, aren't probably like the most <laughs> not always ones. the best huh? oh yeah i'm like where did they go they're not in the thing you know some I, some guy like we we played in in the philippines and somebody in the philippines got in this terrible argument with me about how like this movie sucks what a piece of shit i can't believe that she would leave a perfectly good running sheriff's truck and i was like yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of the places that you took the film to that you like didn't expect to go? I mean, I'm sure you didn't expect to go to the Philippines and no, not at all. That was incredible. 
Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I think Popcorn Frights was was a great place. We had a ter- I had a terrible screening because the sound was. I, I screwed up the DCP and so the sound was terrible. And so that I had an 82 minute panic attack and I think I never got over that. But we went, you know, like Days of the Dead are, are really is just a great bunch of people that run that. Um, George and Audrey and uh, Duke and all those guys are just really wonderful. Angie. And then everybody like Jay at the uh, Horror Hound are, are great too. Like I think my favorite festivals to go to are like more of the horror con slash horror film festivals because i feel like like i went to a couple of film festivals where you you can feel a little pretentious or whatever and it's like oh my god give me out of this place you know i just want to talk about like you know final exam or something with somebody and everybody's like you can kind of tell when you're in that like the velvet rope kind Mm -hmm. of place i'm like i gotta get get out of here man but uh Got to get with your people. I just, I, I know, yeah. you know, I just, I feel more comfortable talking, you know, like at a film convention or horror right. convention, talking to people about stuff than uh, that at some kind of, you know, pretentious highbrow kind of thing or whatever. No, and then, uh, you know, there were some really great, like uh, I went to uh, Wreak Havoc in uh, South Carolina. It was great. I felt like I went to a, a movie theater that was like from 1985. So it was like the coolest. And the, the people there were great. A lot of people that were from like the kind of Chapel Hill this is in North Carolina, so a lot of people who like had actually worked on a lot of the Halloween movies like came out, and so it was it was just a cool time talking with them. I, I think my favorite thing about it is just meeting other filmmakers. I think my favorite was probably we did a drive-in not too far from Champaign, and we played opposite of Halloween Ends on like the opening night of Halloween Ends. I thought we were gonna get like blown out, so I was like scared to death. <laughs> And, and we actually like we actually did more business than Halloween End. So I was like, this is the only time I'll ever get to say that we outsold <laughs> Halloween End in my life. And then uh, we drove. And then on the flip side of that was funny. We drove out and we played at a Smod Castle, which was Kevin Smith's theater out in um, Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey, to like one other dude. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, so that was cool. It was I was, you know, like I was in bands in my 20s and I always feel like it's good to keep that perspective on things because I've driven like hours to play. I remember one time we, we played in like Denton, Texas, and we had to be in El Paso the next day. And that's like a 13 hour drive straight mm. there. So we like basically like loaded out into the van and just drove straight to the gig all night. And then we get there and our the band was called the Firebird Band. And they had us listed as like the Thunderbirds or something. I was like, dude, we just drove through all of Texas just to have our the wrong name on the venue. And and then uh, I, I think I went to like, we went to Juarez at night and I might have accidentally got this guy to jump over with us. But uh, <laughs> that's, that's another story. <laughs> I thought he was from Florida. So... <laughs> <laughs> it was my fault but anyway <laughs> so uh but no it's just you know I, but but it was cool to meet kevin smith and that was pretty cool and uh he's like oh dude you know i'm sorry more, more people didn't come up and he's like dude I, it's all good man i played to the bartender a bunch of times and he's been in that exact same place too and so and i recently read a, a really great q or like listened to a q a with him where he was talking about like you know, bad reviews and stuff. And so that really, really meant a lot to me. I don't know. It's just, I think just making a film is such a miracle. And so to be here at all, it, it's exciting. Like even with that dude in the Philippines who was like freaking out about how she didn't, you know, like, and, and it's funny to me, like, I don't know if you ever seen Pitch Meeting at all, this YouTube channel called mm-hmm. Pitch Meeting. Yeah, yeah. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've, I've seen it quite a few times. I oh, I did. watched it religiously for a while there. So oh, I love it so much. He's like, oh, because he's like, I'm just going to need to get way up off my back about that one right there. Like yeah, that yeah. Little, Oh. Is that where the guy like talks? Oh, wow, he does wow, wow. both sides. Wow. Okay, yeah, I have seen yeah, that. Okay. It's really, yeah. And he says, "Well, what do you mean? Was it well? Because the movie has to happen." He's like, "Oh yeah, the movie has to happen." And so like, yeah. so I think it's like, so it's funny sometimes to listen to people talk about like what they would have done. I'm like, yeah, but then the movie wouldn't have happened, you know. And so mm-hmm. I think for me, what was exciting in his like hateful like negative review of the film was like he. I could I could see like that he was identifying with the person in the film and he wanted them to do the thing that he wanted them to do. And I think to me, even if he's like this is bullshit and she didn't do the thing, it, it kind of made me feel like you did this miracle, which is that you were able to relate to the character in this film. You know, even if you didn't like it or whatever, it's like you were able to relate, which I think was just such a huge. I mean, that's the best thing we could we can do. Make well, it was something. Was something like that. At least he took the time to pay attention to and watch the yeah, film. Yeah, was passionate like, about oh, it. Or why could have been oh, like, yeah, yeah. like oh, yeah. We have a running gag on our show that where we take a third party review off of Rotten Tomatoes, and usually they're so like ridiculous. That's why we include them because they're just really dumb. Like this is the worst movie five ever. Stars. Five stars out of five, or something <laughs> like that. So, this is the best movie. One star. Um, yeah. Right. So yeah. the fact that 
I mean, pissed off or not, like the fact that he took the time to actually kind of oh, yeah. pull that much out of it, at least he gave it the time and, you know, paid oh, yeah. attention to it. So no, I kind of love that. I mean, I, I think to me, it's just like to me, anybody who goes to see the film, it's just exciting that you saw it at all, you know, because I, I think, mm. again, to go back to the miracle of indie film, it's, you know, the first miracle is, is that you finish your film at all. And then the second miracle, which I would say is debatable, <laughs> is, is to get distribution. <laughs> I don't know if that's a miracle or if it's just like you sign yourself up for indentured servitude or something like that. But then, <laughs> and then the final miracle is just that uh, some that is that people watched your film, you know. And so, I, to me, it's it's just uh, it's it's amazing at all. And there's so many right. films that are out there that aren't watched or whatever. So to me, it's just mm. it's such a cool thing. And so that's why, like, we did a couple nights in town, like at a like a multiplex, like a, this you know Savoy sixteen and. I went the first night and I was like, oh, I should probably go every night, actually, because I feel like if someone's there, I should be there with them, you know, because they showed up, you know. And so so I would do like funny gags where I would dress up like uh, the guy telling the story at the beginning of the film. And so I would, like walk in at the end and then all these kids would, like turn around like, oh, my God, like you were the dude. And then I didn't want to like wear the mask because I didn't want to, you know, freak people out. <laughs> <laughs> But it was pretty cool, and we would do. I would do like poster giveaways and stuff to people that came out because it, it just to me it's like this is such a miracle that we're here at all. It's it's amazing that people come up at all, you know. And so it's kind of wonderful. So to me, it's 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 just been exciting. I think to like take everybody's feedback, listen to it, good reviews, bad reviews, and just think about how we can make the second one even better, you know, and just hit it more. And and it's funny like with the blood thing. Because I was looking at, I was really more going for like the Halloween 1978 level of blood, which is like, there's really not much of any blood <laughs> in the film. But, you know, so I, I just remember like, that was like the main criticism, I think. I'm like, well, that's not a big hurdle to jump over, I think, for part two. And I've got a really good friend who's done a lot of like makeup effects and practical effects for Shutter Film. So he's coming on to do a lot of our blood gags and creative kills and stuff for part two. So that's that's really exciting. So I feel like that'll be a, a place where we can level up. And then I'm doing a lot more like steady cam and stuff too. Cause I want to do more of that Halloween feel like some of the times we had like a, a this, uh, it's called a Dana, Dana dolly, but it's like this 10 foot like dolly thing or whatever. And we had 10 foot rails. And so that's why sometimes I was walking through the forest. They're kind of walking slow. Cause we'd run out of track, you know? So we'd be, <laughs> you know, they'd be kind of going slow. Cause I didn't want, if they went too fast, we'd be like, and we got to move in this damn thing so uh yeah it was just anyway it, it's just such a miracle that we're here at all and it, it's it's amazing to me just uh that pe- that that me and you are that we're all talking on at all too so that's exciting but, uh, how, how far yeah. along is uh, is two is the script done and you're like pre-production or is it not that far yet yeah we're in pre-production right now so i've got the so we i, I kind of like take a lot of time with the story so i i really just wanted to kind of break the story first and uh i had a couple of iterations but then like just this past week was finally like, okay, oh, like everything clicks now in a way that's really fun and and emotionally powerful. And then everything kind of makes sense too. And so then some basically, I've been going to the location and we've been starting to do a lot of camera tests too. So I think um, we've been testing out a lot of like different ideas for the next one too. Like the um, Gareth Edwards, the creator has been a big influence on this one with how he shot that film is how I want to shoot the next one with it's much more fluid, much more, like a smaller crew because we had, had like 19 crew in this one it was just way too many people to kind of navigate and so this one is like tighter crew tighter knit do more with less the the cameras are able to, to shoot at a like a higher iso so we need less light and then kind of the world of part two is interesting because it's in this kind of downtown area of, so we kind of leave the camp and we go into this kind of 1993 college music scene of a college town kind of a thing and that's kind of where my era came from was like 1993. I was like seeing tons of bands and listening to the Smashing Pumpkins and Pearl Jam and Nine Inch Nails and Alice in Chains and stuff like that. So that's kind of the the world of this one and like record stores and, and you know, bands and stuff like that. And so, uh, so I think it'll have much more of my personality in the next one, uh, which is exciting. But um, so I, I might have missed your question there. No, I just how far you were. So you, you oh, yeah. It. So I, I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll see what do. I mean, we shot, a, we shot a sizzle reel uh, for the teaser trailer for it. And so that'll probably launch with Indigo Go. I was going to, I was crazy and think I was going to do it in like October. I was like, I didn't, I need some time off because I was so fried. Because <laughs> basically our distributor was like, oh, by the way, your film comes out tomorrow in the U.S. I was like, what? <laughs> so, I was so fried after that. I just, I, I needed a second to like think. Yeah, get a, get a breath of air. 
Oh my God. And I'm ADD. So I'll get myself into a jam where I'm like, oh yeah, we're going to do part two. And everybody's like, really? I'm like, oh yeah, shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I think it was one of those things where I needed to make sure that the story was good, but yeah, Tom is coming back. Bishop is coming back. There's two other people from the Friday, the 13th franchise that are coming in and right on. I'm really excited for the story. I think that it's, it's a, it's a darker story. So I go back to like my favorite sequel of all time is Emperor Strikes Back. So I feel like that's the that's kind of the feel I'm going for for this one, you know. So it's like the heroes are not exactly you know winning yeah. at the end of the day. But I think it's to me it's just much more emotionally powerful. And I, I think it'll be interesting. Like to me, it's like everything that you see in part one, there are things that are calling back to that, and, and sometimes even giving it much more importance. So there might be one scene that we will see from a completely different angle. That's now it's going to give much more like uh, understanding like what was happening or whatever. I think the the beauty of sometimes having characters that you don't know that much about is now like that's kind of a, a, a playground to create deeper characters in part two because the audience doesn't know everything about this one person or that person. So that's been fun. Um, but yeah, but I'm, I'm excited. I think like there's going to be a lot of like really cool set pieces that are I'm really excited to do, you know. So I would say right now, I would say there's elements of like in, in terms of influence for part two, I'd say like The Departed, Seven, Scream. And maybe like high fidelity or something like that, <laughs> or, or maybe, maybe more aspect. like I would I would say like decline in Western civilization. Like if you ever seen oh, that yeah. punk documentary, oh yeah, probably more. Seen all three, yeah, I, I feel that's, like that's quite the more. combination of films there. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so yeah, I think, um, but just just darker. I think moodier is exci- is exciting to me. But uh, yeah, I'm excited because basically everybody, I'm I'm excited to basically just take everybody and just really run them through the the gauntlet on this one. Like you know, like the the smiling happy people at the end of the part one is not going to be smiling happy at the end of part two. <laughs> but it, but it's not that we're going to go to more. I, I think I'll bring more gore, more violence, more blood. But I, I don't know that I'm I'm not I'm not thinking about it like terrifier right. level gore or whatever. You know, which I think is like who could possibly top that? You know, so and that's their thing. Yeah. I think it's so. kind of a calling card. Yeah, yeah. Are there plans so, for it to be a trilogy or de- open ended? Um, I think part two is going to be okay. It. <laughs> so I would, say, I would say like this is this is the how we approach. So what how I approached part one was like if I only ever make a film, it's going to be this film, and I wanted to see a film that to me was like the most fun roller coaster version of a, a Friday the 13th summer camp slasher kind of film because I felt like some of those movies are kind of slow and so now I'm look I've been I was just talking to my friend today because my gaffer we were working on this commercial today I was like part two is going to be like if we only ever make one horror film ever again let's make it like this you know and so I think so that's really fun to me because it's like let's just go all out on making it the best horror film we can make and I think you know it's funny I was fighting all sorts of like things early on with the first one like some people were like I think you should only have like two people die. I'm like, have you ever seen a slasher <laughs> movie before? <laughs> two people die? Like, I'll, I'll, the people will riot. So imagine, imagine that movie, you know, if I made that one, you know. And, and so I think now having been through like the horror film festivals and been around way more horror fans. In it, and sometimes it's great too, because like, you know, I can tell like people care about the film and they want to see us elevate it more. And so sometimes people will be like, oh, dude, I got some ideas for like a kill. And I, I love that because I feel like that's not people like dumping on it. It's more like they want to see it come to a better place. And I, I'm, I'm the same way, too. And so so I think, um, you know, it's, it's just going to be I'm excited. I think it's going to be a little bit more self-contained, but um, I'm very excited for where it's going to go. And uh, and really just just like taking all the lessons that we learned in part one and really just hitting it on this one. So I think just the tension just ratcheted up like, oh, yeah, like high tension. I think it was another kind of, um, you know, influence on the, the part two, not necessarily with like the twist where you're like, wait a second, what? <laughs> you know, but like, you know, <laughs> at least not, not the, butch- the bookshelf decapitation, but I think some of those other scenes with the, the the throat slicing and stuff is bringing those pieces to this one but uh, anyway i could i could talk about this all night i guess so yeah <laughs> well we've kept you for over an hour do you got time for one more question and then we'll yeah. let you you know totally, relax yeah. after your your day so <laughs> this one's a little more off topic but basically what's coming up in horror or otherwise that you're looking forward to what kind of things are on your radar right now hmm. um let's see i don't know um Man, I don't know. I, I've been excited for uh, getting this cr- creator Blu-ray to come in so I can watch it in my, my studio theater at my house or whatever. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I feel like I've been so like focused on this one thing forever, but I feel like I've missed a lot of like I, I need to see Oppenheimer. I haven't seen that yet. Have you guys seen that? No, not yet. 
No, I don't. I don't yeah, have three yeah. hours to devote I to do. Christopher. I do. I just right have now. to find so. it. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, he's all practical, you know. Now, uh, I don't know. I, I think for me, I'm actually I'm excited to like, you know, I haven't, I haven't gotten paid yet from the first one. <laughs> so I'm excited to get that money so we can start doing tests. I think I'm really just excited to start doing actual tests. Continue to watch. I don't know what other movies are coming up. You know, I'm trying to think. What other well. movies are coming up? Um, well, you got Thanksgiving coming out in. Oh yeah, this week. <laughs> I, I can't. I still. I still saw. Did you see a uh, grindhouse in the theater? Oh yeah. And I. That's. <laughs> with all due respect to Eli Roth, I. I don't like how this trailer gives me like not much confidence in it. But yeah. I'll still give it a try. I'm like, why does it look so good? Like. Uh, yeah. I, so. Like I. I love the the leaning into the grindhouse kind of right. thing. You know, and so I feel like if they would have, you know, I don't want to be that dude because I, I get sick of that dude now because I, <laughs> I. I have to like. I have to like temper myself you know cause sometimes because i lean into that like oh, i don't know why do they do i'm like i'm doing the thing yeah. that i don't like so i'll shut up but like uh <laughs> well my big thing is always trying to let the movie like come out and watch it before i decide if i'm going to be mad at it or not oh, yeah. but um <laughs> if you think like, you're pre-mad at the movie before you ever see it like this is bullshit like <laughs> <laughs> there's plenty of movies that i come out of that that come out and i think well this is bullshit i have no interest in that but yeah, i don't yeah, sit yeah. there and complain about it i just choose not to watch it and go do something else um but i think the the thing with thanksgiving at least for me like you mentioned seeing grindhouse it, so in ferndale there was a theater that did a brew and view thing on wednesday yeah. so you could go yeah. see a movie for five bucks it was like a second run theater basically Mm -hmm. and we went and saw grindhouse i think 12 times like 12 weeks in a row there just because it was five bucks mm -hmm. so we just kept going yeah. and seeing it again yeah. so i really fell in love with the idea of the thanksgiving slasher movie based off that little like what minute clip in right. the middle of the movie so seeing the trailer now and it's not just what's in that like initial teaser i guess i'm like oh well that's kind of a bummer so right yeah but Again, I haven't seen it yet, so I can't really yeah. accurately say anything. Like so. That's the teaser to me was like, it kind of gives you it's like that blood rage feel, you yeah. know, like you've seen blood rage. Like I love that movie. It's like those early 80s slashers, like the regional mm -hmm. ones, like Death Screams and stuff, where like it, it's 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 very grainy, it's very, you know, it's kind raw. of corny, very yeah. raw. And, and I love that. And I love like, you know, I remember seeing like Tom McLaughlin his film one dark night and the, the digital transfer like I, if you watch on amazon it still has like the cigarette burns like the real yeah. changes in the corner and i love just that 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 film grain feel to it you know like where like even to go to grindhouse where like they were missing that third reel or whatever you know and then mm -hmm. he's like well if i would have known that you were you know like the dude i would have never you know i love that stuff and uh so I, yeah, and I feel like that's the thing with to go to the modern horror films i feel like horror films should have dirt should have grit in them yeah. you know it's like the difference between like Blade Runner and like Blade Runner 2049, which is like antiseptically clean or like I always had a problem with like the early 2000 slasher films, like because it was like the cast of CW. Yeah. Everybody's like beyond beautiful. The dudes were like, you know. Yeah, I don't remember what movie we were talking about re recently, but I think I went on a five minute like bitch fest about like how clean this room was. I was like, why is this like the most pristine right. building since like the movie Tron or something? So. <laughs> Well, even Tron yeah, had grain. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. And then the, the the second one was like totally yeah, different. Super you know? right. slick, too yeah, clean. It was, but it's it's like, in a computer. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's the thing, and and I think that's why I liked with our film was like it kind of like we kind of fell backwards into it a little bit. Was like the the anamorphic lenses are pretty soft, anyways, and we were shooting kind of below where you would normally want to be, and so they're even more soft. And so it's it was just interesting because I watched halloween and then i watched ours and i was like oh this is basically the same kind of softness in it or whatever but i think for modern audiences they might get a little freaked out because it's not like super clinically sharp like a lot of movies are but i feel like for horror i think you have to have that texture you have to have that feel the grit the raw the the, the dirt you know because then it feels more immediate it feels like you can touch you're, it you're so versus, conditioned yeah you know, with movies these yeah, days yeah. being digital you know they don't they're not <laughs> They don't have that softness to it. So when you see something that's different from that, it's very it can be very jarring. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, what, yeah, what, yeah. I, what am I looking at here? And especially if you're not familiar with anamorphic in general, you know, you're like, yeah. 
Oh. Why, is, why are the corners so soft? Why is the edging, oh, you know, has to, if it's not dead center in the, in the middle? Oh, it's like, I, I feel like we're, we're stuck with, and, and then and then to go to like the camera bros or whatever, like yeah, all these YouTube. YouTube guys are always like, well, yeah, you need to see the thing on the sides. I'm like, that's literally what the lens is yeah. doing. We went like, corner to corner about? sharpness. Oh my God, <laughs> shut up. Like when I went to see, I went to see the creator and I loved it because I could see that the imperfections, in fact, the creator to me was like the most film like film i've seen in years like i felt like i was watching an actual like it was shot on a panavision fanaflex and i love that on the edges and i was i was really paying attention to i seen it like three times just to see in the in the theater because I, I i went to see it myself and then i brought my gaffer and my some other film crew to see it like all right we gotta watch the thing and i was just <laughs> seeing like it, the I'm only like, ones looking at the corner of the screen everybody else I know. like yeah, the cool thing the kid with the head missing the thing to see the fall off and it, but it was like I think it's like that's the that is what makes it have character. Yeah. And, and and my friend Rob mm. who shoots shoots films for Shutter, it's like he's going for character. He's not going for this digital cleanliness, sharpness, or whatever. He wants the thing to feel to feel something, you know. And I think that's the but and and I think modern audiences, it's like they they're just so used yeah. to that thing. And, and I don't know how many times like to me, it's like I feel like for Final Summer, the fun of it is with watching in the dark and a big screen crank the sound oh, yeah. up. So if you're watching on your iPhone, I'm like, forget it, dude. Like, <laughs> I don't these... understand how people watch <laughs> movies on phones at all. Like, it doesn't. Uh, com... uh, it's bad enough watching like a YouTube clip on a phone, but the idea of trying to watch a whole film on a phone, know, like, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd rather just wait till I get home. Yeah, I mean, I feel like like horror to me, it's like you got to watch it in the dark. You got to turn it like loud as hell. You got to get some beers or some other things, and you got to watch it with your friends so you can like yell at the screen. You're like, get the hell! What are you doing? Oh my god! Oh. And then. That kind of stuff. So I, I feel like horror should, you know, maybe it's maybe that's it makes sense why horror is such a great community because it to me it's like it's best when it's you watch it with your friends. So it has that communal thing versus although sometimes it can be really good when you're watching by yourself and you're like, oh shit, I gotta yeah. go upstairs now. To... <laughs> the light switch is all the way over there. Oh my god. I used <laughs> right. to fall asleep. I would fall asleep to like the exorcist, you know, Blu-ray or whatever, you know, and then go back to like the menu screen and be like, ah, and you know, you'd be like passed out, and then I was like, nah, nah, like you know, like three. <laughs> I had a roommate that hated me because I had a uh, this old like Robotech DVD in my computer in my room, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and I Robotech, fell asleep to it. Yeah, yeah. And the the menu music came on. I was so out of it, I didn't hear it. And they their room was next yeah. door. And the next morning, like you can't do that anymore. You got to wear headphones because that's all. I, it kept me up. That's all I heard all night. It's like, oh, I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> I love, yeah, I love that show. That was great, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like Voltron too, but you're always like, you know, going back to like the, you know, the annoying, you know, the, the annoying critics are like, can they just form Voltron already? I've, I've seen like 87 episodes of Voltron. They're just going to do it anyways. Just, just do it from the beginning. beginning. This will be like two, like 20 minute, like a 20 second battle. Fucking Voltron it up and then we're done. You know what? <laughs> would be funny to, to see that one episode where they just Voltron <laughs> right from the beginning and then they're just going in eating yeah, a pizza and like watching at each other Seinfeld or something. Books. Yeah. But the episode had to happen, you know, like, you know, so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. You know, Cool. Well, John, we've Perfect. had a blast having you on. Can you yeah, take you a so. second and plug everywhere? Do you want to plug everywhere where people can get Final Summer, where they can watch it? Sure. Where I mean, I can guess, yeah. but I think you might have a better ear on it than we do. So, yeah, I don't know. We just sold to some distributor the other day, and I have no idea who they are. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, like, can you sign this form? I'm like, sure. All right, here we go. Uh, we're on. Um, sorry, we're on Amazon. Uh, Amazon, Google Play, iTunes. I think we're like Sky in the UK. A um, bunch of uh, Redbox, a bunch of other places. Uh, I, I know we're pirated right now too, which is really exciting. But don't I don't mention that. But <laughs> <laughs> the rad bastards are pirating it. You know, just show up for the Indiegogo. I'll, we'll call it even. But uh, but no. And then uh, yeah, I think right now we're just in the US and UK. And then apparently we're on the dodgy box in Australia, which is. The, their vernacular for the pirate. Oh, okay. I was going to say, is that oh. is that slang for some kind of pirate thing? I think so. <laughs> you know, you've made it's it big time bar. when people are pirating your movie. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was like, I, I guess I can't take it as a bad thing. And I'm like, oh, people are, <laughs> maybe they picked up a couple of viruses in the meantime. <laughs> maybe they'll buy a shirt. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, buy, buy a shirt or something. I'll, I'll feel better about it. No, yeah. And then, um, yeah, we'll see what's happening. And then I, I will have a physical media coming with the um, 
with the Blu-rays. So we get, or with the, uh, the Indiegogo, so you'll have DVDs and Blu-rays. So the Blu-ray will have the 2.0, the 5.1, and then I have this kind of ridiculous, like, you know, 3D version of the film, too, in stereo. So and mainly it's just kind of a gag for me because I, I like watching movies with, like, 3D glasses. Like, I've got my 3D glasses in the mm-hmm. background there. And I just I, there's this this kind of a program that would just 3D five 3D your film or whatever, and I watched it. I was like, huh, kind of works, you know. <laughs> just, it was, it was a little gag. I was like, well, let's just do a 3D version of the film for you know, like for the the hell of it. And because I, I think to me, I just love having the glasses on, watching in the dark. It it it, it's, it calls yeah. back to the eighties, and to me, it's like sure. it makes it even more of an eighties film is when you're watching it in that anaglyph kind of three. Like watching so Hondo. I could talk about. Hondo, do, you totally. see, like, do you remember when they put that in 3D? That was no, like no. here in in the Detroit area. They put it on one of the syndicated like networks. It wasn't actually a network, but just a local thing. And they advertised huh. that thing for weeks. John Wayne's Hondo, <laughs> and they had the glasses at like Kroger, or one of the grocery stores, or whatever wow. you could get with the thing. Oh it was like this big deal. And they, Al Bundy's favorite John Wayne movie. You, you watch the thing, Hondo. and it's like, oh, it's still Hondo. I mean, it's 3D, but it's still Hondo. So. You take what you can get. But I still love like I go to I go to like Amityville 3D and then Jaws 3D are probably like my kind of pinnacle, you know, 3D experiences. But uh Hondo's not on there. You know, yeah, no, I guess not Hondo. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Maybe I'll do like Shane in 3D or like McClintock or something like that. You Pick know. it up. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, well, cool guy. Well, thank you guys so much and feel free to reach out anytime. It's fun. Yeah. I'm talking and uh I think I, th- I think I'm pl- probably planning on launching the Indiegogo for part two in January, so there'll be some stuff there. Yeah, but, let's know. Uh, we'll push it out. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, well, thank you guys so much, man. Good talking to you all. And uh, yeah, thanks, John. Have a great one. See you. All right, so that was John Iceberg, right. director, writer, man about town. Final summer. Make sure to check out Final Summer. Uh, go pick up the movie, buy it physical, stream it, whatever you got to do. But check this movie out. It's good to support indie horror. It's good to support uh, independent filmmakers and. John's a great guy. We're glad that we got to have him on. Make sure to follow them at Final Summer Movie. Um, That's the best place to keep up on their upcoming Go-Go campaign, as well as whatever else is going on with Final Summer. In the meantime, if you wanted to, we'd also love if if you would take the time to follow us. We are at Dewey Pod Monster on all the social platforms. And, of course, you can go to our website at crap.town. And, Sean, what do you got going on? What would you like people to share and look at and other good stuff? Nothing. But if you want to follow my Michigan beer adventures, you can find it at Giraffe Therapy on all the social platforms or YouTube.GiraffeTherapy.com. It'll take you directly to my YouTube channel where you can subscribe, you can watch, you can imbibe. All right, guys, we'll be back next week with the usual shtick and talk to you soon. Have a good one. Cheers. Cheers.